I'm so focused on the four justices, economic justice, educational justice, environmental justice, and social justice. More than 20 years ago, astronomer Carl Sagan embraced our home, what he called the pale blue dot. This tiny image of Earth taken by Voyager 1 spacecraft from a distance of more than 4 billion miles. He said, that's home, that's us, the aggregate of our joy and suffering. Sagan understood our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. This belief underscores the origins and the mission of the McCune Foundation, to be an agent of productive change in society by supporting the growth of social capital in our communities. Social capital that improves people's lives on a daily basis. It's about inspiring collective action as a way to preserve and cherish our neighborhoods, our pale blue dot. But they don't understand that when people come together, we become an unstoppable force capable of taking down any company, any politician. When you're a teenager, there's so much idealism all around you, inside of you. You want to change the world. And that was what I brought to the White House Conference in Youth in 1960. It was a part of me probably from the time I was at least 14, if not before. From the very beginning of their life together, founders Sarah Miller McCune and George McCune devoted their collective energies to making this pale blue dot a better, more equitable place. The founding of the McCune Foundation in 1990 was dedicated to defending and improving people's lives in a real and meaningful manner. Beginning in 1965, Sarah and George McCune built Sage Publications from the ground up. And by 1990, the organization evolved into an international academic publisher. And it was clearly the McCune's plan to impact the very communities around the world where Sage maintained their offices. George McCune was the founding president of the foundation. Despite his death in May 1990, just three months after the foundation was incorporated, Sarah has carried on their philanthropic vision. Originally, we talked about trying to give back to the countries that had contributed to the development of Sage Publications. That changed over time. In the early years, the Family Foundation supported a wide range of philanthropic projects in the U.S., the U.K., as well as in India. Grants provided textbooks for university students in India and London. Funding was provided to establish medical clinics and dig much needed wells in rural India. The money that ultimately flows from our estate should give back by utilizing social science, encouraging the use of social science as well as, in some cases, other sciences that overlap with social science in making people's lives better. We thought that would be in the countries where SAGE published. Which at the very beginning, as I now remember, we were. We did some, some yeah, we stuff did, we in were, India. George and wanted places. to build wells with potable water in India. And, and we wanted to do things in the U.S. and in London where, you know, social justice was not always the highest priority. In 2001, the Foundation's Board of Directors shifted its focus to concentrate on critical initiatives led by community-based groups in both Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Projects aimed at generating social capital, which in turn would help furnish a potent voice to new participants in the local democratic process. Social change doesn't just take place in a vacuum. People in power do not just relinquish their power. And policy reform doesn't just take place because elected officials decide they have a good idea. Truly, it takes community members and empowered individuals to assert themselves, to stand up, and to demand policy change. That public opinion should not just be the public opinion of the elites. It should not just be one group's public opinion, because our country is made of many groups. So the whole point of Tocqueville and democracy was majority rules, 
But minority has rights, and those rights include free speech. Those rights include the opportunity to influence the very public policies that shape our lives. This noteworthy new direction was guided by early board member and political science professor Marilyn Gattel, as well as fellow board member and professor Sandra Ball Rokish, both passionately advocating for this empowering innovation. No longer would the foundation direct funds toward charities and services, but rather would fund projects that developed the community's capacity to solve their own challenges. And I can remember saying after the first five years of our deciding to work at the regional level on building social capital, saying, are we going to do this for another five years? Because if we do that, then we will be typecast forevermore in this community and this region. Is this the road that all of us now on the board want to willingly embrace and walk down together? And everybody on that board signed on. And every new member of our board signs on, and so did the site visit committee members. Sarah is very clear about what her values are, and she doesn't deviate from those. And she puts her money where her mouth is. And she is willing to invest in ongoing relationships with organizations. Most foundations will fund you for one or two years and then bye-bye. We hang in there with organizations that are really growing and improving and increasing their capacities to bring about progressive change. Over the years, Miguel Rodriguez has mobilized Latino residents of Ventura's West Side to create a much needed park while also expanding necessary bus services. He then helped to put the brakes on city officials who wanted to repeal a policy requiring affordable homes and future new developments. Miguel Rodriguez is a community organizer for CAUSE. It's a powerful moment when people recognize the potential they have within. It's just amazing to see how you can start with a very small problem and then as people learn the skills of bringing about change and confronting power, then they move on to other things. It's about leadership development at the local level. It's individuals who, who have a concern in their community but may not know how to address it becoming in contact with an organization that has a strategy and a methodology for mobilizing, organizing, and affecting policy change or reform in their communities. This concept of uh, empowering people to change their own lives and better their own lives through social capital, and building social capital, giving people power, giving them a voice. And so that fits into what the McCune Foundation does, because the McCune Foundation is about enabling, empowering people to not only express themselves, but to work with their fellow citizens, to try to influence them to create the world they want. Community members in this leadership ladder, as they're developing their own leadership, will come from a point of being a participant to actually a leader in identifying the issues that they're going to address, organizing and planning campaigns and actions, and also telling their compelling stories, which is so critical to this when addressing elected officials who are somewhat disconnected to the issues affecting those communities. Our role is really to enable the grassroots community organizations in those communities that are working from the ground up to try and give support, give capacity of the residents to come together to build their own capital, their community capital. Social capital often refers to the capacities that individuals have. I like to think of what are the capacities that communities have. To what extent are they able to come together? Do they have a sense of collective efficacy? not just self-efficacy, so that they think that we can come together, the we part is important, to solve our problems. When social capital exists, you have this functional relationships or networks 
of individuals and organizations that are able to mobilize around campaigns to affect change. And that change could be policy wins such as a street light in that dangerous intersection or the expansion of bus services or potentially increased funding for the schools. But this can only take place when you have a solid network of organizations and individuals that could come together and mobilize around community action. How do you actually begin to counter people that are used to not being challenged? You do it through collective action and you do it through being smart so that you understand how the power is operating. Oftentimes it's invisible. So you have to network and you have to figure it out. Who's really controlling this decision so that you know where the target of your action should be? And that action could be start with discourse and nice, nice, or it could go all the way to collective action in real protest. Well, the McCune Foundation is a model in the sense that it is a philanthropic organization that's about addressing the root causes of social problems. There are foundations that fund direct services, and that's that's critical. That's very important in our community. But foundations that are bringing about meaningful social change are unique. So it isn't the McCune Foundation board making a decision on which issues they want to to have address, it's about the community itself identifying those issues and problems that they want to address because they impact their lives directly. And this informs the McCune Foundation board in its grant making process. But at the end of the day, the building of social capital, I think is what makes not only a community better, but it is a building block of democracy in a country like ours. McCune Foundation grants support traditionally excluded groups who are mobilizing to pursue policies that strongly address their particular needs. We were able to find groups organizing around issues such as fair wages, farm worker housing, immigrant rights, discrimination, empowering youth, and homelessness. Pam Maines, the McCune Foundation's first executive director. The residents have a lot of knowledge. They know what the problems are better than we do. So community organizing means that you pull the residents in in common cause rather than trying to get the residents to do what you want them to do, to help them do what they know needs doing. The Coalition for Sustainable Transportation, or COAST, is a community organization dedicated to neighborhood safety, specifically pedestrian safety. COAST is energized by a tightly knit group of mothers who realize that their safety and the safety of their children depend on traffic safe streets when walking to school, to work, or when shopping. Community organizer Anna Rico is one of those mothers. She's been a leader representing Coast when petitioning the Santa Barbara City Council to take appropriate action in her neighborhood. Anna's tireless efforts paid off. Thirty street lights were installed, which vastly improved safety for everyone. When the City Council approved the plan unanimously, I knew then that all the meetings and phone calls were worth it. Well, community members can be involved in many different forms and their leadership develops in many different forms. But certainly what they bring that's most significant is their compelling stories. It's that farm worker who can give testimony about the effects of wage theft to their take-home pay and how that affects their household. Or it's that grandmother, that abuelita, who could talk very specifically about the dangers of walking home from school when there isn't a street light or there isn't that crosswalk. So community members have that insight about their, their own lives and these issues, which I think are very important to moving forward policy reform, particularly in testimony to public officials. As people learn the skills of bringing about change and confronting power, then they move on to other things. For cause organizer Hazel Putney, the job of an organizer is all about developing leaders 
She views her role as helping others recognize how capable and powerful they really are. At an important public hearing in Santa Maria, Hazel said that there was no need for her to take the podium since there were more than enough confident community leaders ready to speak for themselves. During her time as an organizer, Hazel has mobilized bus riders, rallied support for attendance displacement ordinance, as well as organizing a march to protest police abuses. When I think about community organizing, anyone can list issues such as affordable housing or saving a bus route, but getting the bus back in service isn't the only measurable goal. It's also about how many leaders you build in the process. They're taking leadership roles in their community and they're growing. I, I'm thinking, for example, future leaders, which in, again, invest in, in predominantly Latino leaders, young people, and putting them through a process where they're not only developing skills, but they're learning through doing by being involved with local campaigns to achieve policy reform. Again, that's a long-term investment. And we're already seeing that with future leaders through their alumni who are now heads of organizations, who are community organizers in our community, and who are bringing about meaningful change now as more seasoned leaders. Example after example offer testament to empowered communities making change based on self-determination. The Foundation's core philosophy is to champion groups that are actively doing with others rather than doing for others grassroots, bottom-up organizations, where community organizers and activists are initiators of policy, directly involved in the decision-making. We're also seeing that the McCune Foundation's investment has built significant power in our communities that elected officials can ignore. The impact on the community has been dramatic. Dozens of organizations in the region have adopted this approach one that relies on making systemic change directed at shaping public policy, like impacting living wage laws, supporting and counseling LGBT youth, bolstering juvenile justice rights, as well as installing interpreters at health clinics and schools. But perhaps less obvious but equally important has been the growth of social capital and leadership among folks who don't often have a voice like teens and Latino parents who are now confidently addressing school board members with their priorities for school budgets, as well as undocumented immigrants who are making their own case about the need for immigration reform. The mission is a very unusual one, and I'm very proud of it. The mission is really to enable communities to build their own capacities to bring about progressive change. There are very, very few foundations that actually do this kind of work. But in the final analysis, the most important thing is for communities to be able to work with their own resources to solve their own problems. And so that's what we've become devoted to doing, and I'm extremely proud of the mission as it has developed over time. Immigrants and low-wage working families have embraced and utilized their own power to make social justice a reality and not just a distant dream. Indigenous people's voices are starting to be heard, and not just locally, but nationally. In our corner of the globe, change can happen. On this pale blue dot, change must happen. You know, often when I think of community organizing, I, I think of the work of Marilyn Gattel, a social scientist who served for many years in the McCune Foundation Board. And from Marilyn's study of community organizing, it really is about organizing historically disenfranchised people to build power at the grassroots level to affect meaningful change, but primarily to address the systematic barriers to the practice of democracy. Professor Marilyn Gattel mentored Sarah Miller McCune when she was a student at Queens College and remained a friend and inspiration to both Sarah and George McCune for decades. Marilyn was the founding editor of Sage's first journal, now titled Urban Affairs Review, and an influential member of the McCune Foundation Board during the last decades of her life. Community organizing is one among several strategies for influencing public policy and building social capital. It is the only strategy that can simultaneously develop local assets, strengthen relationships between diverse groups, 
and empower people to actively and effectively participate in the civic life of the larger society. Marilyn Gattel, former director, Howard Samuel Center for State and Local Government, City University of New York, Graduate Center.